Proverbs 22, 1, the Bible says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Amen. What do we see here? Uh, Noah, uh, the verse that Noah chose uh, speaks to us of having a good name. And let's say that you, you have a good name. Your middle name is Christian. If you could think about that, there's no greater name than to be named by the name of our Savior, identified with the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Christian. How many people don't appreciate that? How many people don't carry that name with any kind of respect, any kind of reverence, any kind of uh, uh, appreciation for who we're named after? Uh, uh, we read that verse in the book of Acts where the, the believers are called, first called Christians in Antioch, and, and we look at that and say, well, you know, what's the big deal about that? Everybody's a Christian, you know. You know, you know, my, you know my dog's a Christian, you know. But, you know that, that, that's such foolishness. We appreciate that name. That's the name of our Savior that loved us and, and gave himself for us. That name, Jesus Christ, is the greatest name that's ever been spoken. There's never going to be another name higher than the name of Jesus Christ because at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God the Father that he's Lord. I mean, there, uh, his name is the supreme name in all of the universe, and, and it's sad and tragic and, and perverse and perverted that man would take that name, that lovely name of Jesus Christ, and use it as some kind of slur or some kind of invective or some kind of uh, blasphemy or some kind of curse word uh, when, when it should be the name that's lifted up and, and regarded as the highest and loftiest and the best name. That is a, the greatest name. But, but, but again, Noah, uh, you chose a verse, and, and I, want, I want to leave this with you today and, and give this to you today for something to think about. The Bible says a good, name is rather to be, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Your mom and dad gave you the name Noah, Christian Kybe. They gave that to you. But you've got to choose what that name means to yourself and everybody else. You choose, Noah, what Noah Christian Kai means to this world. And the Bible says if you make a good choice, a good name is rather be chosen than great riches, it'll be worth more than any, any valuable substance in this world. Noah, I, I'm not preaching at you. I'm just trying to encourage you. You've got a good name. Biblical name, Noah, Christian. Those are, those are good names. The name Kai has been well earned by, uh, where's Kevin at? He's out there, okay? He's out doing a good job for us. I see him through the windows there. He's on in security today. Uh, but the, the name Kai is a good name. So you've been given a very good name. But you, again, you get to define what the name Noah, Christian Kai means. And, and again, uh, first of all, uh, having a good name is a choice. Second of all, as we look at this verse, having a good name is better than having great riches. You say, Pastor Ross, why? Uh, how could that be? You know, I'd rather be rich and have a good name. Uh, my friends, the Bible would disagree with you. Having a good name is much more important than having great riches. Why? Because a good name promotes trust and confidence. You think, you think of how you respond when you hear different names and, 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 and associate it with different people and, and how that, that, that affects our judgment, how that affects our emotions, how that affects our attitude toward those names. Uh, and again, it, it's very simply borne out by even just our, our common experience. I, I look at the uh, uh, most popular child names and I never see the name Adolf at the top. Why? Because he chose to live a very wicked and vile and murderous and satanic name. We choose what our name means and how that name is carried. So a good name promotes trust and confidence. A, a good name is lasting. Again, that, that, that example of Adolf, that was, six, that was 70 years ago. That name has a lasting influence, and that's, that, that's another reason why it's better than having great riches. A good name is lasting, and the last, though, last of all, a good name brings favor, loving favor in our verse. The Bible says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor than silver and gold. I believe that that good name brings that loving favor with it when we think kindly. And you think about the people in your life that you love and what those names mean to you and how that affects your heart and how that affects your attitude toward them. Uh, that, that, that love that it engenders in us is a wonderful thing because that person has chosen but how they've lived their lives and the choice they made to evoke those feelings and those emotions in us because of their actions. Amen. And Noah, I thank you for choosing that verse because it has a good lesson for all of us. Having a good name is very important. And let me just say this. Uh, parents, you choose what the name mother or father means. Amen. Whether it's a good connotation or an evil one, a, a happy one or a sad one, a, uh, a glorious one or a tragic one, we choose by our actions and the way we deal and the way we conduct ourselves in our homes what the name mother or father means. Uh, I, and, and again, I never made to make light of anybody. Sometimes on Mother's Day, uh, uh, folks that didn't have a, a good mother figure in the home, they, they, they say, Pastor, I wish I, I wish I could feel that way toward 
my mother, but I, I don't have those, those memories. I don't have that, that gentleness. I don't have that with me to, 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 to hold on to and, uh, and to think kindly of others. Uh, uh, the father I grew up with was not loving, was very distant, very cold, not a part of my life. And so when Father's Day rolls around, uh, I don't have those emotions and have those great feelings of, uh, of, of joy that I had a, a father that, that, that brought good, good memories back. We choose what that name means in our home. We choose what the name child or, or son or daughter means. We choose what the name Christian or church member or, or citizen means. Amen. And we can look out in popular culture and see citizens doing all kinds of disgraceful things, and they disgrace uh, what it means to be an American by their actions uh, and, and by their words and by, uh, just by their conduct and carriage. And, and again, we choose. You know, you, you've heard the, the term ugly American. And it was given because uh, tourists from America visiting foreign countries just to act like beasts and acted like they were better and, and, and privileged uh, when they would visit other countries and forgot that they were, they were merely guests in those countries and, and, and did not respect the, the laws or the, or, or the society in which they were uh, uh, walking about in. They, they, they gave the rest of us a bad name. We ought to do well for ourselves, and not, not only for just our namesake, but uh, uh, for our home's sake, our church's sake, our, our country's sake as well. A good name, Noah, and thank you for that verse. I come to Nathan now, over in the choir. Nathan chose his verse, Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 31, verse 6, Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. When I read Nathan's verse, I was, uh, uh, this thought came to mind, uh, good courage. We ought to have good courage. Why? Because we have a great God. And be strong and of a good courage, the Bible tells us. And fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. These are Moses' words to Joshua. We, we see these words repeated in Joshua 1.9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. We need to have good courage. Why? Because we've got a great God. Amen. Nathan, let me just say this. You're going to need to be strong. And you've proven that strength. But you're going to need to have strength going forward. Amen. Your strength must be in the Lord, though, because your earthly strength will fail you. Your physical strength will fail. The, the strength that you have inside will fail. But your strength must be in the Lord. And, and, and that strength uh, is improved and renewed day by day as you realize uh, in, in this verse here that the Lord, it is he that doth go with thee. He goes with you. Jesus Christ said in the end of Matthew, in Matthew 28, uh, uh, at the end of Matthew 28, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world, amen. There's one constant companion that's going to be with you that will give you that courage, that will give you that strength, and that's the Lord God. He has promised to go with you even at the end of the world. So until this world ends, you've got a, you've got a heavenly companion with you, and that's the Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. Amen. Not only does he go with you, but he will not fail you. I, I, I didn't know the, the group was singing that song today, but uh, Jesus never fails. What, what, a, what a perfect lead into this point. He's not going to fail you. Amen. I might fail you. Others in your life might fail you, but I'll tell you what, there's one that will never be on that side of the ledger, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. It might look like it for a time. It might look like it, or the devil might try to convince us as we go through valleys and storms and things like that. But, but you know what? Those are just God's ways of, of testing us and proving himself to us. And when he brings us through those, we'll see that he hasn't failed us. Amen. He will not fail you. God can do anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the fairest of 10,000 my soul. God can do anything. He can do anything but fail. He can save, he can cleanse, he can keep, and he will. God can do anything but fail. Those words are from a, a, a wonderful uh, little chorus. God can do anything but fail. Good courage. He goes with you. He will not fail you. And lastly, he will not abandon you. God will never orphan you. There are going to be, Nathan, there are going to be people that come in and out of your life all the rest of your life. Some will be very, very good and close friends for a while and time and circumstance and opportunities might take them, might take them out. But you know what? There's going to be one that's always going to be there. He's not going to forsake you. He will always be there. Amen. One of my favorite verses, one of the most comforting verses I find in all the Bible is found in Hebrews 13, verse 5. And at the end of the verse, it says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You've got his promise on that. In the Greek, it's an impossibility for God to leave you nor forsake you. Amen. What a great verse you've chosen. And what a great encouragement that is to us. Good courage. Noah, Noah's verse speaks to us of having a good name. Nathan's verse speaks to us of having good courage. 
We then come to the verse that Alyssa has chosen for us. Where's Miss Alyssa at? There she is. Okay, I'm just looking around here. I'm all confused. I mean, you could be sitting in the front row every week, and I'd still look for you. Um, Alyssa chose as her verse, Psalm 56, verse 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Alyssa's verse speaks to us of having good comfort. When I read this verse, uh, the verse after it also speaks to us in Psalm 56, verse 4. It says, in God, I will praise his word. In God, if I put my trust, I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Alyssa, you've chosen a very wonderful verse for us, uh, reflecting God's comfort, and that is a good comfort to us. Amen. Alyssa, you're going to face some fears, and probably are right now. Graduating and college and, and leaving home, these, these are very legitimate concerns. But rely on your verse and rely on the God in your verse. What time I'm afraid I will trust in thee. You take those steps by faith. And, and just as Nathan's verse tells us that God will never leave us nor fail us, that, that God goes with you too. And you can call on him. What time I'm afraid I will trust in thee. What does this verse speak to us? It, it tells us certainly that we're going to face fears, uncertainties, and questions. We're going to face times when the night's dark and when the storms are rough and, and, and situations are not favorable. But you know what? When we, when we encounter those things, guess what? What time I am afraid, I will trust any. These words are spoken by David. When you think about these words, it was David that with a pocket full of rocks and a slingshot went out to the battlefield to face Goliath. And, and let me just say this. He, he, ran toward, he ran toward Goliath, did he not? You don't, don't for a second think that he wasn't afraid. You're facing a nine foot nine inch monster with a spear and a shield and a sword that are bigger than you, and you only got a pocket full of rocks. You better be trusting in something bigger than you. And that was God. And guess what? You're going to have your Goliaths in life. They're going to be shouting at you, they're going to try to intimidate you. But you know what? What time I'm afraid, I'm going to do like David. I'm just going to keep trusting in the Lord. Amen. Acknowledge these times as I come, as they come your way. It's okay to tell the Lord, I'm, I'm scared. It's okay to tell the Lord I'm uncertain. It's okay to tell the Lord I'm, I'm not sure. It's okay to tell the Lord I, I, I just don't know because he knows already. Amen. David acknowledges. He wasn't ashamed to acknowledge this. Amen. Alyssa, remember to turn to the God that is your trust and confidence and deliverer. We learn from Romans 8, 28, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, even in our times of fear. But realize this too, Alyssa, that even though we do fear sometimes, that perfect love casts out fear, for fear hath torments. Just realize God loves you so much more than we could ever describe, we could ever comment on, we could ever, we could ever tell. What a wonderful God we have. Amen. What time I'm afraid I will trust in thee. Even crosses from his sovereign hand are blessings in disguise, an old poet once wrote. And I think that's very, very true. Amen. Thank you for choosing that verse for us today to remind us, Alyssa, of our good comfort that we have in our great God. I wish Brooke were here to hear this. She's down helping her and, and being a blessing to another church right now. But the verse that Brooke chose for us was Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, where the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. When I looked at this verse, I see a good promise. That last part of verse number 6, And he shall direct thy paths. Yeah. Think about that for a second. I, I don't know what's going to happen five minutes from now, five hours from now. Five days from now, five weeks from now, five months from now, or even five years from now. But God sees eternity and its never-ending spans. And when we meet his conditions, he is the one that says, I will direct your paths. We are told and taught by the Lord Jesus Christ when he taught his disciples how to pray in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, he said, After this manner, therefore pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Deliver us from evil. Lead us not in temptation. He said, let my paths not be led in the area, the avenue of temptation. Amen. When God is leading us, then our paths are being directed by him. Then he can direct our paths away from those things that will hurt us, away from those things that will separate us, away from those things that will damage us, away from those things that will frustrate us and, and, and cause us to fail. He shall direct thy paths. To have the loving, tender guidance of the Lord as we make our way through each of our days and the challenges we face is a promise of highest value that we may be led by the caring hand of our Heavenly Father is a, a precious and most desirable promise that we could ever be given. As we look at Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, we know those. We, we sing the scripture song, the, uh, the tune that goes with those verses and, and how wonderful it is. But uh, uh, these verses are conditional. Uh, this promise is a conditional promise. How do we get God to direct our paths? Well, the Bible says, first of all, we must have a wholehearted trust in God. Trust in the Lord with what? 
all thine heart. God's not looking for half measures. God's not looking for us just to partially trust him or just occasionally trust him. God's saying, look, I want my confidence to be in you every day. I, I want you to be, uh, I want your trust to be in me wholeheartedly. When God calls us to love him, uh, according to the great commandment of all the Bible, then guess what? That commandment uh, is, is this. We should love the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, all our strength, and all our mind. He, he wants it all. He doesn't want just part. Christian, can I say this? God doesn't want just an hour of your time a week. He doesn't want you just thinking of him, praising him, worshiping him, considering him just for an hour a week. He, want, he wants to walk with you every day, all day. That, 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 that's a relationship that he desires from us. And so if we're going to get God to guide our paths and direct our paths, then guess what? It's going to have to be a wholehearted trust that we place in him. Second of all, it's going to, have to, it's going to entail a refusal to rely upon our own intellect, apart and independent from the Lord. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. I said it in Sunday school, this, our Sunday school class this morning. I want to say it again for, for the benefit of all to hear. What the devil promised Eve was a life independent of God. Right. You shall be as gods. You, you won't need God anymore to tell you what's right and wrong because your eyes will be open. You'll be able to make your own judgment call on those things. And boy, we live in a country, we live in a society, and in a world that does not want God, does not even want the thought of God. Why? Because this world wants to say, you know what? I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to go my own way. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Nobody's going to, nobody's going to put any boundaries on me because you know what? I am a free moral agent, and I will do what I want, when I want, how I want, where I want, and because of whatever reason I choose. And that's, that is so satanic at its core. Amen. Amen. If we desire God to direct our paths, then we've got to get to that place where we refuse to, to, to push God out of our thinking, where we refuse to say, you know what, God, I got this on my own. Every time I think about doing things on my own, I think about the mess I make. I am my own worst enemy. I, I make the biggest messes of my own life. Every time I think about this, I think about the first time that Emily tried to feed herself. <laughs> Spaghetti, no less. She didn't get very much in her mouth, but she stole that, that spoon out or that fork out of her mother's hand and said, I've, I've, you know, I'm, I'm going to feed myself. And she grabbed that out of there, got the spaghetti on the fork, and it went on her hair, went in her ears, up her nose, uh, covered her eyes. I mean, it was all over the floor. I think the cat got a little splashed on. I'm not sure. Uh, it was all over the table. Uh, it didn't go where it was supposed to go. She made a mess. Why? She wanted to do it herself. She was too little to do it herself. If we'd see ourselves as little in God's eyes, then we wouldn't have to worry uh, about that. We would, not, we would not be trying to yank the controls out of God's hands. We would not be trying to, to, to rip uh, 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 the, 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 the privilege of, of directing our paths out of God's hands. We would allow him to, to lead us and to guide us. Amen. He would direct our paths when we put our uh, wholehearted trust in him, when we, uh, we have a refusal within our spirit to rely upon our own intellect apart and independent from the Lord. And lastly... When we would uh, uh, evidence a daily awareness of the presence of the Lord and a constant dependence upon him in our choices. The verses go on to say this, in all thy ways acknowledge him. So again, a daily awareness of, of the presence of the Lord and depending upon him in our choices. In all thy ways acknowledge him. So it doesn't mean just in the big things. It doesn't mean in the important things. It, it doesn't mean just in the, in, in, the, in the essential things, but it means in all thy ways acknowledge him. So there ought to be a daily awareness. Uh, when we're in the Lord's prayer, again, we're, we're told to ask for our daily bread. There ought to be a daily coming to him, a daily awareness of God, you're in charge, and I'm just, I'm just a sheep of your pasture. You're the shepherd, I'm the sheep. You're a your leader, I'm the follower. Uh, you're in charge, and I'm just doing what you asked me to do. That, that there comes a, a comfort in that. I don't have to make the choices. I'm, I'm not in charge of this. Why? Because God is. And when I get to that place where I'm willing to place my whole trust in God, when I refuse to rely upon myself independent from God, and I, and I come to him daily recognizing and, and acknowledging him as, as my God and my Lord and my guide, then guess what? He then does uh, have the privilege and will direct our paths. A good promise. I want God directing my steps. I want God helping me to avoid the pitfalls. I want God to help me to avoid those things and those situations, those circumstances, even those relationships that are not good for me. Amen. How does it happen when I trust him? When I, when I trust him when he says no, that it's for my good. I found this out in my life and in, in, in the lives of many other people that I've dealt with. Folks are more than happy to get along as long as you're saying yes. But as soon as the word no is heard, all bets are off. I don't want to be like that with God. I want to take no happily. No, you can't have this right now. No, that's not good for you right now. No, we'll have to wait on that. But why, God? I'm an American. I want, uh, you know, we live in a Burger King society. Have it your way right away. But God's not working at Burger King. 
God is sovereign and God does what he will when, when he will uh, when, and, and how he wills and, and for whatever reason he wills. And he doesn't, he does not, he's not obligated to tell me why or explain himself or to give me what I want. He does what brings him the most glory and what's best. For some reason, I think I'm the center of the universe. Well, God, I want this and I want it now and I want it in this color and I want it in this quantity at this price. And if God, could, if God would scratch his head, he probably does that sometimes with me. This is, you're Bob Ross and I'm God, you know, uh, I think we got the situation backwards here. Amen. But when I'm willing to put myself subservient to him and, and put myself under his charge, then he says, okay, now we've got it right. You, you go where I tell you, you go where I send you, and, and guess what? I'll take care of getting you there. Amen. For graduates, wonderful job. Noah, Melissa, Nathan, and Brooke, all the way down there in Bell Vernon. Um, great job. You've chosen some wonderful verses. Don't leave them behind. Re rehearse them to yourselves. Remember what they mean and, and all they imply and, and live with them and let them encourage you and, 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 and realize there's a God behind those verses that loves you more than any preacher could ever tell you, any teacher could ever explain to you, any parent uh, could ever demonstrate to you. Uh, you. You've got a great God. Keep trusting him. Keep following him. Keep realizing that you bear a great name when you, when you are his child. Amen. If I could leave you with one just encouraging thought today. It's in the form of a poem. It was written in 1932 by a man by the name of A.M. Overton. A.M. Overton was a preacher, a Baptist preacher, by the way. And um, he, uh, he and his wife had three, three children, and she was carrying their fourth child. In childbirth, um, she and the child both passed away, and he was left to care for three uh, little children. Uh, and, and it was on the occasion of, of, of the passing of the, the, the little child and his wife in childbirth that he wrote these words. And I want you to, the reason I tell you that is because these words will, will carry a little greater weight when you think about them and who wrote those. The poem's entitled, He Maketh No Mistake. My father's way may twist and turn, my heart may throb and ache, but in my soul I'm glad to know he maketh no mistake. My cherished plans may go astray, my hopes may fade away, but still I'll trust my Lord to lead, for he doth know the way. Though night be dark and it may seem that day will never break, I'll pin my faith, my all in him, he maketh no mistake. There's so much now I cannot see. My eyesight's far too dim. But come what may, I'll simply trust and leave it all to him. For by and by the mist will lift and plain it all he'll make. Through all the way, though dark to me, he made not one mistake. Amen. I could leave that with you today, young people. It's going to seem like there's some mistakes being made and some miscalculations on God's part. But, you know, just trust that he's not making mistakes. He's just making a way. He's not failing you. He is putting things in place to help you to succeed. That's the kind of God you have. Just keep trusting in him. Amen. And thank you for allowing us to be a little part of this great accomplishment on graduation day.